I'm happy with that, Luke. Go for Perfect. it. Excellent. So we're recording now, and I'm going to start letting people into the room. All right. My own samples are behind the laptop here. There we are, all the lovely people. Aren't they all ha a handsome bunch, huh? <laughs> Look at yes. Mike McClinic there with, that, with the lovely gilet. How are you, Mike? Um, no, it's I, I feel like a broke record because I said this last night. I said this every tasting, but it, the best thing about these starting these, Alex, is when you see the familiar faces, the people who, who keep coming back for more, the gluttons for punishment, as they say, you know. Um, but it's great. So we'll give it one second there, guys. Well, I can see there's even someone joining in from the waiting room as we speak. So we'll give it a minute for everyone to add up. There's another person coming in now. So we'll and another one. Yeah, I do. I like keeping it on the uh, gallery view there, uh, just to see you know how, how who's out there, smiling faces. It's nice to, as we know, in these trying times, be able to uh, see someone's uh, face, even if they're just staring at a screen. So yeah, and see their living rooms as well. Like, you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's a nose in this part too. You're right, too. Like, yes. Yeah, that's why I have the virtual background on the whole time. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's been a, about a 30 seconds of inactivity there, so we may as well get underway and late, latecomers can join us anyway. Oh, there's someone else. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, for those of you who this might be your first tasting, uh, my name's Luke. I'm, I'm the manager of the Celtic Whiskey Bar and Larder down in Clarny. We're the world's largest collection of Irish whiskey and the, the largest whiskey bar in Ireland. We're also home to the Irish whiskey experience where we, we educate uh, all comers on, on Irish whiskey and, and beyond. And um, we have a lovely little cocktail menu, lots of craft beers and spirits and a, a nice little restaurant. You were there yourself in the summer, Alex. We were talking about that before. Yeah, the food is brilliant. I'm always impressed with the food that you guys have down there. Brilliant. Well, our chef, Jason, he's a, he's a fantastic chap. Um, so I'm going to pass you over. I'm going to pass them, everyone, on to your cap very capable hands, Alex. Before I do so, um, <laughs> uh, as per usual, guys, we'd love to get, uh, we'd love to hear a, your questions, get them in the, the chat, and that's what I'm here for. I'm here to pass them on to, to Alex. Um, and also your tasting notes. We love hearing weird and wonderful taste notes as they come up. We've had some absolute crackers. Alex, we did a, we did a tasting, um, I think it was with Glen Morangi there in January, where one, one someone said that the whiskey tasted like a spice bag, um, like from a, a Chinese takeaway. And it was, yeah. like, <laughs> it was an incredible tasting note. So, um, you know, keep keep your weird and wonderful tasty notes coming. But just through. keep it clean, please. As we go <laughs> into a lot more whiskeys, there has been a few times where people have had tasty notes, and you're like, yeah, that's um not the that's not really you know uh, good for public. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Look, it's 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 always really special when we're when we're joined by someone you know who who is is such a well known name and and person in the fig in the industry in terms of someone who's, who's not just a, a brand rep or ambassador but who 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 actually is part of crafting how this thing um comes so thank, thank you for taking the time to join us alex um for those of you who might not know on the chat do you want to tell us a bit about yourself before we get started absolutely so my name is alex chasco i'm the master distiller master blender for the team whiskey company um most people uh, their first question is well, what does that mean exactly and i guess what that means is that i'm responsible for the liquid so i'm responsible for everything you guys uh, have in front of you in those little tasting packs there um if you don't like the packaging if you don't like the bottle or you think the price is too expensive or you can't buy it in your favorite store that's somebody else's responsibility that's not my <laughs> responsibility i can't fix those things right i'm the guy who's in charge of the actual uh liquid uh which yeah for the most part has been uh great there have been a few people that have had some um you know comments uh that's fair enough i, I i'm always uh, uh able to take uh, uh criticism on the chin but uh no i think people have been very happy with the whiskeys that we've come out with at the tm whiskey company and i think that tonight we've got a great selection of uh, four of our Bravazon series. So what you have in front of you this evening is the, the full collection of the Bravazon series. And we're gonna go through that uh, one by one, starting off with number one, of course, and then up to number four. Um, a bit about myself. So I am I'm not Irish. In case you haven't guessed, I am not actually from Ireland. I'm from Portland, Oregon originally. 
Uh, and uh, the short answer of how a guy from Portland, Oregon ends up making whiskey in Dublin is my wife is Irish. So uh, I'm here for, for um, love, right? Or as John Teeling, uh, Jack and Stevens Teeling dad, he likes to remind me every time I see him, I'm here for lust. Lust <laughs> brought me to Ireland. And um, as a side venture of that, I get to make uh, world world's best and award-winning uh, Irish whiskey. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I started out as a brewer. I started out making uh, craft beer back when it was called micro brew beer uh, back in the 90s uh, in Portland, Oregon. And um, so I started out making uh, uh, cast condition British ales, uh, porters, stouts, IPAs, ESBs, all of those sorts of things. A little place called Bridgeport. And Bridgeport Brewing Company has the distinction of, I still can't believe that this is true, but it is true. It's the first place in the North America to make a IPA. We took that uh, old English standard of an, an Indian pale ale and reinvented it uh, in our own uh, like uh, in, in Portland, Oregon, with three times the amount of hops that um, were, were used in it previously. And uh, as a result, it caught fire and went around the world. Um, now, Bridgeport didn't catch fire and go around the world. Bridgeport's actually out of business now. <laughs> so there's a good example of, um, you know, good idea. People liked it. Uh, it became popular, but not because you were brewing it, uh, not because you were selling it. Uh, so anyways, I guess there's a lesson there for us uh, somewhere. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so I started making whiskey. Oh, long, longer than I'd like to admit ago. Yes. Uh, and I'm the first employee of the Teeling Whiskey Company. So I would have been at, with the Teelings and their involvement in the Cooley Distillery. I would have been the innovation manager in Quebecan. Uh, I would say, if you've ever been to the Quebecan Distillery and you see the little distillery that's there with the wooden washbacks and the wooden mash tun and the little stills that they have there, that's what I, that was one of the projects that I worked on, was setting that up. And then when Cooley was sold to Jim Beam uh, about eight, almost nine years ago now, um, I jumped ship with uh, Stephen and Jack, uh, and uh, they're the founders of the Teeling Whiskey Company, and I'm the first employee of the whiskey company. Um, and it's been a pretty amazing ride uh, over the last yeah, eight, nine years, as we've set up a company, developed products, you know, got it out to market, uh, built a distillery, um, you know, won some awards, yeah, had the world was our oyster there until about a year ago this time when we uh, decided that, yeah, we had to uh, close up the oyster, I guess. Uh, so we're, we're waiting patiently. We're still making whiskey in Newmarket Square in the, the Liberties. If you haven't been to our distillery, please come and see us. Um, we are in uh, Newmarket Square in the heart of the Liberties, and we're making whiskey seven days a week there. Uh, in fact, there's somebody there right now running the stills. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't had people out to be able to visit us for over a year, which has been strange. It's been odd to, we used to have, uh, you'd usually it'd be like a French tour group of OAPs that would come through at about 10 o'clock uh, on like a Tuesday morning or 9.30 on a Tuesday morning. You'd be like, where are these people coming <laughs> from? Like, what, huh? Like, I'm not here to judge. If they want to drink whiskey at nine o'clock on a, Wednesday, like, who am I to say, no, you can't, right? But like, and now it's like, there's nobody there for so long. There's like, I would love it if we had 90 old French people walking around the place drinking whiskey and asking me questions in French, which I don't speak French, so I can't answer that question. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so true. That's like, you know, when every person down here in Kerry, in, in, a, in a warm hearted way, you know, jokes about all these Americans who, who descend on the place every summer and we're always <laughs> taking the piss out of them. And now we, we desperately miss them. So <laughs> it's funny, you, you know, you, you, um, you don't know what you got till it's gone, as they say. Um, but it's a fantastic uh, tour you've got, got down there in Teeling. I, I, I did it a few years ago and I had done like Dingle Distillery. I'd done Kilbegan and a few others and a few distilleries in Scotland. And it was a, a totally different experience walking into Teeling. It really felt like you're walking into a modern distillery. It's so clean. You're all all you guys are in behind this glass window and um it's, it's like, the illusion right <laughs> like 
under the water the feet are going like crazy but behind the glass windows like yes we know exactly what we're doing mm. yes well, yeah but it was it was like walking onto onto the set of star trek or something you know <laughs> so clean like <laughs> And it was warm as well. It wasn't this like a cold it warehouse. Warm there, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's definitely a great visit. I, I definitely recommend um, anyone on here who hasn't to, to get down there. Um, so we're going to start with the with the Brabazon One, are we, Alex? Yes, we're starting off with Brabazon One. There we go. It's always good to get a whiskey going, and then we can uh, get some little chats, hopefully. So this is Brabazon One. <sighs> This is the first in our series, right? And if you haven't seen the bottle before, there it is. What I always love about this bottle, it's got emboss and deboss on it. So there's parts of glass that are built up and stick out, and there's parts of glass that are inside of it or you know, in, indented into it. Uh, but it's a, it's a lovely bottle. Mm. And um, you, recently, you recently bought that into your your regular range the, where the, the the small batch and the trinity range are now in in boston in quite yeah place. we have we've taken the lessons that we've, that's a sort of pattern that we would definitely do of like um with the the big expensive bottles try new things see if people like it and then when they uh like it then we can roll it out to the um the core range yeah so you're right we have we've taken some of the um the lessons the the little oh. Uh, strip stamp here with the little mm. circular bit at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that clearly or not. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. better. Um, that's part of our uh, standard uh, range now. Uh, so there, yeah, there are little things that we've learned from doing this bottling that have, you know, from a packaging point of view, come across the, the rest of our whiskeys. All right, so if we pour that out, right, there's a couple things you should notice right away. First off, we are talking about 49.5% alcohol in this bad boy, right? So uh, it's got a, a bit of a, I don't want to say punch, but it's got a bit more weight to it, right? So if you give that a swirl and give it a nose, yeah, what I'm getting off of it is a bit of cooked apples and sort of like stewed apples on there, a little bit of like brown sugar kind of on the nose too, right? Mm. And what I would encourage everyone to do is I'd encourage you to, to try it at the full 49.5%, and then I'd encourage you to put a little bit of water into it, right? It's definitely, it's, it's, um, it's got a very, I always thought, even, even when I very first tried it a few years ago, it's got a very almost like old school um, nose to it. There's almost like a mustiness that comes through that you don't get and that you maybe get from an older Jameson or an older um, uh, Bushmills that, that was maybe bottled in, in 2004, but distilled well before that, you know? Um, and I don't know if that's fair, but that's definitely what I get personally. We've got- No, oh, I think it's very fair. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adam Dunn in the chat says there's tequila on the nose and uh, Vin Kylie says hints of licorice. And then Rob is asking the question I was about to ask, uh, is this the first or second batch? You did a couple of batches of this one, didn't you? I would guess this is the second batch simply from a matter of statistics. Mm. No, I think and it is the, the, batch, the yeah. first batch was sold out quite a while ago. So I would imagine now the bottle I have in front of me is from um, February 2018. I think that is the second batch. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I filled the vials so I can confirm it is the second batch. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I was just trying it's, to. Uh, it's rare to find the first batch still, um, uh, you know, in a shop unopened. If you find batch one, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between batch one and batch two. I think, but you know, some people do have favorites, and I, I think that's nice. I like that element of, you know, not trying to hide behind this um, ruse of uh, oh, all whiskey is the same. It doesn't have any differences. Like you're saying, well, no, like. I go into the warehouse and I pick the casks and we try and make it as similar as we can, but like each cask is individual, each cask is unique, right? And, you know, there's going to be some slight variations to it. So let's try and embrace that. Mm. Yeah. Well, I know when the second batch came out, we get our, our stock emails and it was like, oh, Rebs on batch two is out. Now it's back in stock again uh, for, for number one. And I ordered it uh, in for the bar. And I got a case of uh, Teeling Brabazon Volume 2 in. So obviously, batch one, uh, batch two was misread on the emails. <laughs> there you go. Yes, that was, uh, <laughs> that 
that was part of why we moved on to three. To be completely mm. like frank with you, right? That part of why we were like, you know what, we're not gonna have this continue on with like Brabazon one batch three. No, Brabazon three. Like we just said, no, we're just gonna we're gonna stop at batch two, <laughs> and we'll move swiftly on to Brabazon three. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's worse things to be sent though than than a load of volume two. So. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yes, worse things have happened in C. That is for sure. So I noticed when you put a bit of water in there, and I did a very scientific uh, glug out of my uh, beer uh, glass here. Um, it gets a bit more, I think, pastry. I like, think there's a bit more like a mushroom kind of umami kind of thing going on there. That's the Oloroso cast. Mm. So I noticed that the Oloroso comes through a bit more with a bit of water. On it. But, but yeah, I, I just think it's more yeah, earthy. But then there's also like a um, apple pie kind of. Well, that that, paste, that pastry and fruit that kind of yeah thing, it? yeah yeah no apple pie is a good a, a very good tasting note. Rob in the chat says um uh, methanol finish to it for for me very uh, oh, sorry menthol <laughs> not methanol methanol would have been bad I suppose alcoholy <laughs> but uh, menthol is what he means. My apologies. That's my disappointment. Reminds me of the old methanol days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Heat and spices right off the bat, says Aiden Quinn, uh, dries off uh, quite quickly, uh, but displays lots of complexity. A walk in a damp forest comes to mind, um, and Sh Surly says some chocolate notes with water. So yeah, yeah I think the walk in the damp forest is what I would refer to as earthy, right? There's mm -hmm. that bit of sort of um, musty, not like bad musty, but like, yeah, like it's just rained and wet pine needles kind of uh musty foresty kind of smells to it yeah mm -hmm. so i suppose we're walking in a damp forest eating an apple pie um that so you do <laughs> <laughs> with a little bit of spice in there right a little bit of uh, nutmeg and vanilla thrown into no definitely it's it's a cracking whiskey so while, while, while we're sipping on that alex maybe tell us a bit about what 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 brabazon means Ah, what Brabazon means. Brabazon is the, um, Brabazons uh, well, were and still are the Earls of Me. So the Brabazons were the, um, the lords who were put in charge of the liberties in Dublin, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, right behind our distillery is that there, Brabazon House. Brabazon House is where our offices are. So um, there was a desire to sort of remind people of this uh, bygone era, I guess you'd say, of uh, Dublin, right, of the Brabazons and of their influence, not trying to make excuses for them or to hold them up on a pedestal or anything like that, but just to, to say like, look, they, they, there's Brabazon Place, which is right around the corner from the distillery. There's a, there's a big influence in the liberties from the Brabazons. Um, what I've, for me, what that journey has done has um, connected the dots in ways that I never thought of before. And that the Brab, so you, you had the liberties, the liberties were created uh, by uh, Henry II, right? And there was the different abbeys that were in charge of different parts of the liberties. It was 13 liberties where you had freedom, you had basically tax rights. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a tax break on making linen or the tax break on brewing beer or on selling wine or on whatever commerce that you were going to take place in the liberties, right? And then Henry VIII came in and he, of course, sacked the abbeys, right? And in sacking the abbeys, he made William Brabazon the Earl of Meath. He took control of all of that wealth from the abbeys, right? He put the Brabazons in charge, right? And the first thing that he asked <clears throat> William Brabazon to do was to create a new market in the, the Liberties. And so William Brabazon created New Market Square. So he was, he was more well, well known for his jousting than he was for thinking outside of the box. And to be fair, if Henry VIII had charged me with creating a new market in the Liberties, I'd probably stick to the, you know, stick with inside the lines a bit <laughs> myself. Like, <laughs> Um, 
But I just find that crazy that like I go into town. So I live in Clontarf. If I drive into town, I park my car every day in Newmarket Square. I don't think anything of it. And there is a market square that William Brabazon created based on a order from Henry VIII. I'm like, wow, that's that's mad. Mm. Right? Yeah. Things afterwards, as we all know, kind of got a little bit pear-shaped after that, right? But like, um, I, I think it's uh, uh, interesting to uh, to learn about and to talk about those that that history that the the Barbazons had. No, definitely. I think we, we we can you know there's no point in whitewashing um, any part of our history, you know, and and you know the Barbazons is an important story part of the the South Dublin story. I mean, the age age old question that you always get asked, or at least a few years ago when you were a bartender from people coming to Ireland was like, oh, the difference between Protestant and Catholic whiskey and this idea that the, the Jamesons were these Catholic emancipators. And you're like, well, no, it's not really, you know, it's not as straightforward. You know, when you think of the penal laws and how wealth was distributed in this country, it's always a lot more um, complex than you think. And there's um, uh, the, the fantastic book, A Glass of Hearts and the history of, of Pottsville whiskey comments and the fact that when, when Irish whiskey is in the you know, the Jameson family and, and the Powers families were unionists. And when, when Irish whiskey was in the doldrums and needed help and a bailout from the government in the 50s and 60s, there's records in the Shannon, um, who I think the, one of the Jameson family was a senator at the point, and another Fianna Fáil senator turns around and says, why would we help you? You were, you know, you didn't want this country to exist, you know? So this, this, these class and religion and political lines you know, you know, come are just are an inevitable part of the tale of the story. Like you know, and this, you know, understanding them, retelling them, and and enjoying them is is part of it, rather than trying to celebrate them in a in a more pure way, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think um, for me, as a complete outsider to it, right, it's it's a story, and it's it, I'm not trying to um, make it right or make it wrong, but just it, it's an interesting story, and you know, the, the, I think the great thing is. Aren't we a modern Ireland that can be aware of our past, mm -hmm. but hopefully move forward in a, in a way that's you know progressive and better for the the society as a whole? So, anyways, there's there's my bit about the Brabus House. The, they can fight their own battles; they don't need me to <laughs> be in their corner. What do we think of the whiskey? Do we like the whiskey? Well, I, I definitely, I definitely do anyway, and I, I'd like to hear, um, as I'm sure you would, what everyone else thinks in the in the chat um elaine says yeah. my sister's here with no sense of taste or smell uh, but says it's burning on its own but not burning with the water um so that's fairly you know I, I'd, I'd agree that tends to be with the high spirits there's not a, mm. not really wrong there uh, aiden quinn says love it burning um love it not burning bless her sorry um <laughs> brian says it's really nice uh paul says some soft toffee notes and uh, now after a bit of water mm. um so definitely uh, Noreen Casey says, really like it. I prefer it without the water. Um, so that's interesting. I definitely think, I think the, the kind of the sherry notes come through more without the water personally, um, or maybe it's more unique with it anyway, you know, that, 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 that I think you get, tend to get flavors with the water that you might associate, what, what you might expect to get, you know, when you drink a lot of whiskey and you know the cask finish, your brain is already ready for certain flavors. Exactly. Um, and they're, 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 they're less obvious without the water. So. Yeah, that's my, that's my yeah. experience anyway. There's, there's a few things that I, I think are pretty important there. One, whiskey has over 3,000 different flavor components, right? So mm -hmm. that's a full assault of your you know, sinuses and your, your, your sense of smell and your taste buds, right? So if you want to find a little bit of something in a whiskey, you can find it. The one that always gets me is apricots, right? There's, there's pretty much apricots or peaches in every whiskey. It's just whether or not you want to go looking for it, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as somebody says, it's like pink elephants. As soon as somebody says apricots, it's like, that's all I can taste is apricots now. Thanks a lot. That's a great <laughs> um, and what I think is really interesting though with our smell. So our, our sense of smell is far more sensitive than our sense of taste. Our sense of taste is limited to taste buds that are going to get sweet and bitter, right? Salty, those kinds of the, the seven basic tastes, right? Your sense of smell has got far more sensitivity to it. But the way in which your brain is connected to that little bit of, of um, membrane at the back of your sinuses where you smell, right? 
where the volatile components from something, anything, right, come into your nose and they get processed by this little that one square centimeter patch, right, in the back of your sinuses. That neural pathway has an element of your brain that's emotional. So there's always going to be emotions associated with your sense, right? And so I think that where that, how that comes through and how that comes out is very interesting. And in the way that I really like it coming out in the Irish sense is the pub, right? That like we have a place where we go to, to get our mental psyche ready for eating and drinking, right? That you can't just like, be walking down the street and like enjoying a nice whiskey and get all of these different flavors and everything from it, right? You need the full sense of the place, the occasion, the, the thing that we're all dying for at this <laughs> moment, yeah? Uh, in order for you to be in the right mindset to think, oh, I'm drinking a Irish whiskey that's been in the sherry cask. I, sh I should be expecting these kinds of flavors from it. Yeah, mm. that's really... Um, interesting no that's that's it's it's fascinating it's one of the most interesting sides of the whole experience i suppose but it's hard to just turn that on and off you know particularly off in terms of what you expect and what you don't expect you know and it's hard to i mean there's a, 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 a i won't say who but a tasting we did recently on here and the person dropped the stock into the bar um in person they said oh taste this and they poured out a bit of the whiskey and at the time i was like oh yeah that's interesting i was thinking god this is terrible stuff like you know i think this is awful whiskey and then we sat down and did the tasting and i really enjoyed it you know because you're relaxed and you're on the zoom with everyone here seeing familiar faces pop up and chatting with someone um like we are now and suddenly the whiskey was like oh this is gorgeous whiskey i could drink this all day but in in the middle of the day when he dropped it in and it was all go 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 we we're filling whiskey packs you know you're it, it all yeah. you the alcohol almost you know yeah, exactly. Your nose is dry. You've been working. You're hot. You, you know, you, you're not in the right mindset. There's all sorts of different uh, uh, reasons as to why. Yeah, you need to take the time to uh, prepare yourself. Yeah, and and that's um, I think that's that's probably one of the most difficult challenges that I find as a, a blender is uh, how do you try and be on right at nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning when it's, you know, bucketing rain outside and it's two degrees and there's a million other things that you've got to do and there's a million other places you'd rather be. And, you know, how do you try and mentally make the space to prepare yourself to like make a judgment about, yes, we're going to go this way. No, that way is definitely wrong. Like that's, that's the hard part. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's very true. And, and that's, I suppose, why you get paid the big bucks, you know? <laughs> because we have, um, I have a, fr a friend of mine who's who's recently um, started a whiskey brand um, and they were, were had bought these casks and, and had all these plans and they were at home playing with a few blending flavors and they were like, oh, this is great and this isn't so great. And they were really proud of this little home blend they'd gotten done in the early days of the company. And then they, they had always planned on hiring a, a professional to, to come in and do a few blends for them. And uh, when the professional came in and did, you know, they were, they showed them, oh, this is my little blend. I'm quite, quite proud of this. It's X amount of sherry and X amount of this. And uh, the blender came in and, and did their bits. And then afterwards, he said, comparably, his was terrible. But he was like, you know, in, in, he thought he was doing great until someone like yourself, who, who's, who's, a, who's a talented addict, who's able to, to put themselves in the, the mindset and create all these flavors, is able to just be like, oh, no, well, this is now these three casks. This will taste great. And it blew everything out of the water, you know, so. Mm. it is very subjective it. too mm. well it's a skill though i was giving i was trying to give you a long way of giving you a compliment <laughs> <laughs> thank you here's the thing that i learned in making this was this is the story that i feel is important for for me and my journey if you will of making it. we had access to casts that had been fully matured in second and third fill sherry casts fully matured right so i'm talking about 14 15 18 year old single malt right had been nothing but sherry casks. And those are hard to find in the Irish whiskey industry. Those are, those are rare gems to get those, right? And so we had those, the Teelings had bought them a while back and we were like, great, we're going to use them. This is wonderful. And I was looking for a way to use them. And I started playing around with them and making up some whiskey and doing some, some small tastings with some, um, both the way I usually do it, 
is with uh, a bit with people around the office. You'll see me walking around the distillery with a glass like this, right? And I'll say like, oh, why, don't you, why don't you try that back pre-COVID, right? When you could give somebody a whiskey and they wouldn't think like, oh, I'm gonna catch my death off of you. Um, and, uh, you know, I would, it would be by committee, right? Where I would informally go around and, okay, what does Jack think of this? What does Stephen think of this? What does Ian think of it? What does um, Una think of it? What does Rebecca, what are the people around the office? And, you know, there's people that, like, uh, I know that if I'm overdoing the sherry, Una is not going to like it. I know that if uh, Rebecca really likes it, the sherry is probably uh, close to being about right. You know, you, you start getting little threads of feedback there. What so then I went to saying, okay, let's have a tasting. Let's do an actual tasting. We'll get 20 people in and we'll do an actual tasting of this whiskey. And what I thought was interesting was people were drinking whiskey that had been fully matured in sherry casks, right? And they weren't talking about the sherry. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how can you not get the, it's an 18 year old single malt that's only been an Oloroso sherry cast. How can you not get the sherry influence there, right? And, and these were people that knew their whiskey. And what they were getting off of it was the European oak. They weren't getting the sherry influence because the, the penny finally dropped for me a few days later. I realized, ah, what we think of, what we in the like whiskey purchasing community think of as being sherry cast is sherry finishes. Mm -hmm. It's the bright sherry influence that comes in the last 18 months, two years, whatever that you're going to finish your, your, your whiskey. And that, that's the influence that normally people associate with a quote unquote sherry bomb, right? And what we had was fully matured sherry that has lots of sherry influence, but it's more European oak that's influencing it as opposed to quote sherry. So with Brabazon 1 and with Brabazon 2, it was getting the balance right between the fully matured and the finished and the different styles of Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez sherry in it to, to come up with this whiskey. That was the difficult part. No, it's fascinating. And I suppose that, that, that brings to mind two questions. So one of them I'm going to ask you now, and then the other one I'm going to ask you after we come on to the next one. So in relation to this is six different sherry casks, if I'm not mistaken. And is there, is there a particular source of them? Is there a particular bodega? Or are you just dealing with, with, with whatever cask worked best? Or uh, there, There's different sources, definitely. Uh, hmm. and, and that's probably not by design. That's, that's because the whiskey, for the most part, is whiskey that um, somebody either in Cooley or some other distillery, right, would have had a product. They would have been really excited about this eight-year-old single malt that was a sherry cask, right? And then the sales tanked. They weren't, nobody bought it, right? And everyone's like, oh, we didn't sell nearly as much whiskey as we thought we were going to, right? What are we going to do? And what they did, and what happened a lot of times, is you go to John Teeling, and John Teeling starts laying down the money on the table, and he buys up the 300 or the 400 barrels that are left over from this great idea that everybody was excited about for a few years and tanked, right? And his view is they're not making any more of it. You can't go back eight years in a time machine and make more Irish whiskey and put it in the sherry cast. So he doesn't have a product that it's going to go into, right? But he knows now I've got 300 barrels of eight-year-old single malt and there's not going to be any more of it, right? And then he just lets it sit there. If you have a duty suspended warehouse, you can just let it sit there for and in some of these cases, you can let it sit there for a decade. Mm -hmm. Right, until some crazy American from Portland, Oregon comes along and says, I know what I'll do. I'll take that tremendous failure that somebody else had and uh, I'll reinvent it. I'll put 15% of that in with 30% of this, 10% of that, 5% of this, and we're going to make Brabazon one. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a joy and there's an opportunity, right, that comes from that, right? But there's also a lot of responsibility that comes with it also. Mm. Um, yeah. That's, no, that's brilliant. That's, that's um, a fascinating peek behind the curtains, I suppose. The, the only, only interesting thing there, uh, which isn't the other question I had, is that what I always found interesting about older, we have a, a, a huge, we're very fortunate to work with a huge um, 
backlog of old Cooley releases going back to the 90s in, in the in the bar. I'm sure you've seen our our menu. There's there's loads of miscellaneous releases. I might be older. familiar with it, yes. Yeah, there's older Tier Connells, all the ones that said pure pots on them and all this. But there's very, very few few um wine casks, as in I mean that in everything, in terms of you know, you know, there's this of the old Cooley, there seems to be a very heavy ex bourbon influence, but it's actually very rare that you'd see a port, a Madeira, a sherry. Um, it's not that they don't exist, but they are quite rare from that period. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good. That's a good uh, observation. Yes, you're right. Uh, a lot of what the Cooley and Irish distillers uh, and Bushmills, for their part too, were putting whiskey in. I'd say ninety percent of Irish whiskey was going into bourbon casks. There was a small amount that was going into sherry or port. Right. There was an even smaller amount that was going into something as you know fancy as a Madeira or or some other kind of wine casts or something like that right mm. but um i think what happened oh about 12 maybe 15 years ago is irish whiskey realized holy cow there's like a whole other rainbow of other casts out there that we can start putting stuff into and i, I feel that, that that's maybe more than anything my um i'm not saying i'm the only one but my influence i think on irish whiskey has been let's put it into unique cast types and and that's not like a um, a genius, uh, brilliant move, right? It's simply a matter of like we've got twelve year old bourbon casts. Who's interested in a twelve year old bourbon cast? No, not me. Who's interested in a twelve year old Madeira cast? Mm. Oh, I'm interested in the Madeira cast. Who's interested in um, you know some stout casts or some this or some you know like it's like boom like we can we can start to make all these different unique flavors, right? Because let's be honest, like an eight versus a 12 versus a 15 year old bourbon cast, not a whole lot of difference. With them. No, there's not, no. And that's why like, you know, when, when we have, in, if you look at scotch, I mean, I, I probably, I love Irish whiskey, but I probably drink more scotch on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, not recently, because we're doing these tastings, but but um, <laughs> but the reason is, because when you, when you can pick up a 16 year old port cast or 16 year old sherry cast for relatively cheap, you know, these phenomenal single malts from Glendronach or Balvinia, yeah. Abelauer, um, Glen Farkless, one of my favorite brands. And they have all these these flavored single malts and they're, they don't cost that much. Whereas you do, you know, and, and it's easy when you're spot with that kind of choice. Why would you go for the 12 year old expert? But not that it's bad, but it's that there's 20 different ones of them, you know, so I suppose. Um, speaking of which, though, it might be a good time to come on to the to the port cast, which is the, the all right. one too. And do these ones have a similar story in the sense that this is uh, would have been old stock from Cooley as well? Yes, this would have been old stock that the uh, Tian family would have had, right? Um, what I will say, though, for me personally, it's it's not that I don't like sherry influence on whiskey, right? But I really like port. Mm. Uh, so for me, the port one was definitely a, a labor of love, and 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 what. Like those, that's, these are nothing new. These aren't new ideas of like sherry and port and Irish single malt, right? But I think that it's the use of the fully matured and the finished, right? And the different styles of sherry and the different styles of port and getting that balance in, right? That's the interesting aspect of, of these two whiskeys. So number two is port. It's our Brabazon two, not to be confused with Brabazon one batch two. Um, and uh, this was very much a labor of love for me. There was, there was nothing, there was no, um, there was no pain in creating this whiskey, I can tell you that. Um, not that there is much pain in creating whiskey. <laughs> there's, more, there's more pain in actually making the whiskey than, than going into the warehouse. Once it's in the warehouse, okay, that's okay, right? Today, Jesus, today was a bright, kick you in the ass horrible day for me i've been in the distillery since 8 a.m trying to get the sting i won't even go into it but like uh yeah there's there's days that are horrible on distilling but it's uh usually the equipment and the uh the making of the the whiskey making of the spirits right mashing the milling the fermenting the distilling that's the that's the hard part mm. brian uh on the chat there is saying no go into it he wants to hear your story <laughs> No, um, trust me, Brian. Nobody wants to hear that. 
maybe if, oh. you, if you sign up to to myself and alex's patreon um we'll do that in the bonus content <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, um, there's a hidden easter egg in the playback that you can click on for the one thing I noticed when we were filling these, Alex, is that they're both um, 49.5%. Uh, the first one was similar to that anyway. And um, yes. is that, I didn't ask you this for the first one, but is, is that a natural percentage or, or are you, did you decide to bring it to that or? Uh, what we wanted to do was the Bramazon series was also, it was an attempt for us to uh, revisit some of that older stock that we had, right? That had been fully matured in cherry cast, fully matured in port cast, right? But what we also wanted to do was um, address, uh, we have a lot of single casts and single casts are great, right? You can do a single cast at cast strength and people get excited about it and like, oh, I'm gonna go and buy that bottle, right? But the problem with single casts is in my mind is twofold. One, they tend to be one dimensional. They have a great nose or they have a great taste but they don't usually have a great nose, great taste and a great finish, right? Because they're a single cast. And the other problem with it is you go to the your favorite off license. You go down to Celtic whiskey shop and you find this uh, single cask five nine eight, right? And uh, then you come back four weeks later and you're like, oh my god, that five nine eight was amazing, right? And I get another bottle of it, and no, you can't. It's gone, mm. right? And so, how do you try and create something that people can come back to and hopefully buy a second bottle of and not get disappointed that they? missed out on their one chance, right? Um, and have a bit of a limited release uh, with the series. So that's what we we're trying to do with this was from a commercial standpoint, gives people a, um, a, a chance of buying a second model. Basically. So you're saying you wanted to make it rare, but just not that rare, is it? Exactly. <laughs> rare, but not that rare. And uh, not 58% alcohol blow the head off you, right? Let's go with 49 and a half because you can still kind of drink that straight and, and you know, walk out of the room. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, so talk us through this. I mean, it's, it's uh, for me on the nose, I found it very uh, alluring, but also we didn't have the same kind of, maybe kind of dark fruit no notes, the kind of black currants that exactly. you expect. And again, we would go back to that, what you expect on the nose, you expected those kind of port notes to come through, but they, they don't, not, not straight away anyway. I get red fruits there. I get plums, pear, like pear in there. Mm. I get... Um, well, I definitely get more plums, pears, um, maybe a bit of peach as well. Yeah, um, exactly. Kind of, say, lots of pitted fruits, yeah, yeah. What I meant is I don't normally expect from, from port, I normally expect you kind of blackberries, kind of those kind of darker fruit notes. Exactly. So this is yeah. ruby port, a bit of tawny port, and uh, white port in there. Mm. Well, maybe that, that white port, now that you say it, actually comes through with that, that touch of pepperiness. Um, ben says there's, there's green apples on the nose. Uh, Paul says heather comes to mind. That's a, mm. a great tasting note. Um, uh, Oliver says heaven, so that's also a good tasting note. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good whiskey there. Mm. In my book, like there's hair, even there's hairs standing up on the back of the arm, and like it grabs you. It's like mm. that's there was a, a tasting that we did uh, several years ago in Germany. We did a release where we did a Riesling cast finish, and I went to this uh, winery outside of Frankfurt and I uh, was there with the, the winemaker and it uh, turned out that uh, he used to be uh, one of the top uh, winemakers for Bollinger. And um, he makes these uh, beautiful uh, biodynamic uh, reasonings uh, outside of Frankfurt now. Uh, and uh, and it's, they're, they're gorgeous wine. And uh, we were doing the, the wine and the whiskey tasting together and he was kind of getting it and kind of not. And then we came to Brabazon 2, and he's like, wow, that's an amazing whiskey. I was like, well, there you go. Like, if the <laughs> man who's making Bollinger likes that whiskey, then you're on something. Say? Mm. No, it's gorgeous. It reminds me, and it's better than this because it's, it's, it's more complex. But one of my favorite whiskeys um, ever, particularly at, at a price point, and at its kind of being off a bit, bit less, less than obvious, is the uh, Palace Bar 12 year old, um, which mm. is called Port Cask. And, um, you know, it's very similar. 
Mm. Yes, they are very similar whiskies. Yeah. Um, but at the time I tried that, it was it was it was very rare that you got an all port cask Irish whiskey, I and mean, that was, that obviously came out before this one. And you might get the odd port finish, but but having an all port cask is great. So this is is really exciting because it's it's um yeah it's got loads of those flavors, chewy sweets on the finishes. As rich as there in the chat, um, a bit nutmeggy, lovely after flavors. Yeah, no, they're all great tasting notes. It's got more mouthfeel as well. It's a bit more in the gums, a bit more tannic than the first one. Um, mm. Yeah, there's. I think that chewy sweets. There is that sort of like um, uh, gummy kind of boiled sweets kind of um, freshness to it. Yeah. Mm. There's something to the side of it that reminds me of the um, the Dunville's Palo Cataldos. Um, in that they have this, it's it's not as as dry as you initially as the first hit, and then it becomes chewy in the in the sides. And I think you know they're very different whiskies, but I think it has the shares that for me personally shares that characteristic. And I suppose they they probably be of, of similar spirit or origin. I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. I also I, I'm, as I'm re familiarizing myself with it, there's that floral note there. Mm. There's that sort of rose water. Yeah, real. Yeah. You know what? Uh, <laughs> there was a period back in the Cooley days where David Hines and I shared an office, and uh, I was doing tasting notes once for I forget what Cooley whiskey, and uh, I said uh, hibiscus, and he was like hibiscus, like who? What are you like? <laughs> you, you gave me a look like you hippie, like what are you like? Are you kidding me? Hibiscus? Who's drinking hibiscus? But like, I get a hibiscus note in there. Mm. I get this sort of, I mean, you can say rose, you could say, I guess, rhododendron too, if you really wanted to go down that route, but like. Well, I don't mention rhododendrons, they're, they're a curse <laughs> not here in Kerry, but um, the, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I definitely, I 100% agree with you, I definitely get that, but I wonder, is it because, you know, because you, you know, it's all very suggestive as well, <laughs> but, but you're definitely right, yeah, yeah, Eric in the chat says, uh, nose is fruity, berries, and some cough syrup. Uh, taste this mm -hmm. fresh fruit, strawberry, and peppery. Definitely that peppery, uh, um, 100%. Uh, yeah, there is a pepperiness there, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also that strawberry is interesting. Mm -hmm. while, we're, while we're kind of sipping on that and putting out some more flavors on it, this is my Jeremy Paxman question here, you know, the hard questions. Um, you were talking earlier about your, your decision by committee and blending. Um, how much of that, if you want to be honest with us, and, and maybe talk about the industry in general and teeling, um, is done by analyzing the stuff digitally or, or by computer. Do you know, I know that a lot of big whiskey companies tend to, to bring up graphs that analyze different elements of the whiskey to try and keep consistency and stuff, do you know? So there, there's, there's, you know, it, it's kind of, it's less romantic, but I suppose it is a, a reality in the industry. If you want to maybe shed some light on that. I mean, I don't know much about it. Myself. Yeah, so my background, before I was a brewer, I was a chemistry student, right? I had a chemist teaching and and i and my chemist uh teaching would have thought through uh gas chromatography and liquid chromatography and the beauty of a detector that's known as a mass spectrometer right you can basically take anything you want and you can blow it up into its chemical components right and sort it all out in nice even pieces and um, sure, it might take you a while to decipher the little ticks and the little what's this and what's that, right? But like, we can basically figure out anything, right? So yeah, you put your whiskey in there, it's got over 3000 flavor components and all that, right? And we can, we can make it work. We can have a, we can make, you, know, you can go to Hewlett Packard or, or somebody and they can have a box that you can inject your whiskey sample into. And it's just a matter of figuring out the methodology for it to print out a sheet of paper that tells you this is a floral fruity whiskey with X number of tannins, blah, blah, blah. Turns out that's not possible. <clears throat> it's not possible for a lot of different reasons. Those boxes that are developed by uh, different uh, chemical analysis uh, uh, companies, right, are primarily engaged in the pharmaceutical industry and the petrochemical right? Whiskey is not a pharmaceutical or a petrochemical, right? Mm. So the, the methodology kind of breaks down a bit there, right? Um, when people start talking about those, those scientific analysis, right? You know what they're doing actually is they're putting a, a sample into a gas chromatogram, right? And, and then at the end of it, there's a funnel 
when somebody sits there and they put their nose against the funnel and they smell and they, they make a note of like uh, 17 minutes in, I get green apple. Uh, 18 minutes in, I get um, pears, right? Like, and that's because the GCO, like olfactory, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's as advanced as things get when it comes to smelling and tasting whiskey. Or what you can do is you can dive into the deep end, right? And pull it up and do what we've been doing here, right? Mm. And just get stuck into it and say, I really like that. I find that, you know, you can use flowery words like amusing or uh, uh, closed or open or, you know, whatever. There's all sorts of different ways that we can try and uh, verbalize this, right? But um, I think that the reality of it is that your nose and your tongue are far more sensitive and capable of discerning different aromas and tastes than any machine ever will be able to. And um, what you really need to do is just dive in and get stuck into it, right? And um, you might make a dog's dinner of it. Uh, and it might be amazing also, right? But you, you'll never know unless you, you get started. <clears throat> my, yeah, my approach would be more by committee. I'm not some sort of whiskey genius. I'm not some guru that goes up on a rock and comes down 10 days later with, you know, tablets about the truths of whiskey, right? Like I'm the guy that goes out and, um, you know, says, hey, what do you think of this, right? What, what, like, hey, Luke, you seem to know your whiskeys. What do you think of this whiskey? Hey, Michael, like you seem to know a thing or two. Like, what do you? And we and we have a discussion. We talk about it. People say things. And I'm like, wow, I never would have thought of that before. Yeah, I guess that's true. And if anything, I think what I probably do is is edit. I probably do realize like who's got a good nose, and I probably should listen to, or who's actually uh, um, not super. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's that. No, that's that's interesting. I suppose that ties into a question that was asked earlier, um, which I've been kind of holding back in reserve. And uh, Neil Buckley says, "Do you have a warm up routine before getting into the tasting and evaluating? Do you have like a a, a ritual? I suppose." Yeah, I, yeah, I try to. I try to um, uh, make sure that I'm uh, in some place that uh, has uh, um, not a lot of sensory sort of uh, distractions, right? That I can focus, that I'm, I'm mentally, that I'm in the right state, right? Um, I try to keep uh, hydrated with uh, water, not because of like any like liver function or anything like that, but just because whiskey, it, it dries out your palate, especially I find when I'm talking. If I'm talking and drinking 49.5% alcohol, right? My mouth gets dry and then that, starts to influence or close off what you can or can't uh, taste. And then I think the biggest thing for my routine is repetitiveness. So I'll taste it today. I'll take a few days break. I'll taste it again. I'll write down some notes as to what I think of it, right? I'll, I'll let that bottle sit over in the side of the office there for a month and slowly come back to it and realize like you know when i put 13 percent american virgin oak in there that was probably overkill i probably could go for a first fill bourbon cast and i'll do different and so what you'll see in the office is, is me writing out like what it what it is in shorthand right what the strength of it is and then the date and then i'll have in my notebook what did I do on that date? And I'll go back to the notebook and I'll look and I'll be like, ah, yeah, see, now let's go back to that one from the 16th. Yeah, see, it's it's far too dry. It needs more fruitiness to it. How are we gonna get more fruitiness in there? Okay, we can go and look at some white burgundy casts. Or we can go and look at some, you know, pork casts, or we can try and do this, or we can try and do that. And it's revision, 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 revision. Go out and get feedback, go out and get feedback, go out and get feedback, revision, revision, revision. That's the that's the process for me. No, that's fantastic. Um, no, uh, it's it's it, it is interesting because it's it's sounds to me like it's it's as much about um, being meticulous and consistent over time, you know, rather than sitting down and 
you know, going, ah, I declare this is a fantastic whiskey, as you mentioned, you know, this is, <laughs> you're not declaring from on high, um, like the Testaments or whatever. No, that's fantastic. Um, maybe introduce us to, to Brabazon 3, because I'm conscious that I, I know I am, and I can see a few people in the chat that, that are no longer going straight to the glass as they were a minute ago. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's less of this chit chat, more of the drink drink, right? Brabazon 3. Brabazon 3 is where we start to step things up a bit. So we've got this lovely box that Brabazon 3 comes in with the house. That is, as I said, Brabazon house. I've always wanted to turn it into a, like an admin calendar. I thought that would be cool if we had that like, that's be Jack Teeling's <laughs> office there, right? And that's Stephen Teeling's office there. And what if you like opened it up and like there was Stephen Teeling having a Christmas party in the back? <laughs> that would be... <laughs> They didn't like that idea so much. I don't know why, but yeah, I thought it'd be great. No, definitely, um, you got to be quirky. I was looking at, at a thing on TikTok about um, cool ways of storing Blu-ray DVDs nowadays. You get these collector's editions of um, Breaking Bad or something, and they 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 unscrew and they twist off in different ways. You know, you got to be creative. You know. Oh, very good. All right, so yeah. I'm ahead of my time, is what you're saying. Well, uh, yeah, in the whiskey industry, yeah, but the, you know, a notoriously conservative and stuffy industry. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't it would not be difficult to be ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah. So what we've done with Brabazon three, if you can look there, can I bring it in there? We can see a little name there, Pedro Jimenez. Yes, Pedro Jimenez is the famous Belgian who went off to Spain and tried to make white wine and he failed horribly. Um, and uh, what they ended up doing with uh, those uh, white uh, wine grapes that Pedro Jimenez planted in Spain is uh, making sherry out of it. Uh, so we've got this Pedro Jimenez sherry. And if we give this a little swirl, a little, nose what i hope you're finding off of that is this figs chocolate tobacco richness that's there there's a real like dried raisin fruits right that's that's in it uh and that is coming with no chance that's coming from from these guys here from the lighting right Jimenez Spinola. So these are <coughs> casts that we got from Jimenez Spinola. They were 1918 was when the uh, uh, Solaire was started. And that's what the sherry is like that comes out of it. So it is naturally fermented to 15% alcohol. Uh, and then it's aged for a very long time. Uh, they, they just call it very old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and if you take the cork off of there, and I wish you could smell it, it's got a, yeah, figs, dates, chocolate. Yeah, there's a bit of like, yeah, tobacco, kind of burnt sugar richness to it. And that flavor is all in the whiskey. That's what I get when I start, when I sip this whiskey, I'm taken to the Bodega with Jose Antonio, who's the eighth generation sherry maker. He's a crazy guy. He's this uh, crazy Spanish lawyer who uh, his family is the Jimena Spinola family. And um, he's the, the winemaker for them. And uh, it is really, well, it's an honor to get these casts. So these are casts. This is a part of the, the, the Solaire. So the Solaire is the stack. It's five high, right? And what they do is they, each year, they take uh, about a third out of each cask and it goes down to the next level, right? And it's a way of uh, progressively blending and aging your sherry. And so the Solaire that these casts are from was started in 1918. And, and hadn't been broken since then. Now these casts themselves don't go, the, the Solaire goes back to 1918. The casts that we have are were made handmade in the 60s by one man in Jerez, 
right? And and that's that's what we've got here. No, it's it's a, it's an incredibly special um, whiskey. I'm blown away by it. We, I've, you know, confession. I had tried the the one and two before. I actually hadn't tried this one before, and it's a it's a really phenomenal um, whiskey. I think in the chat there, uh, Adrian says it's cream of the crop so far, but I think it might be top five of some of the best whiskeys we've had here since we started in these virtual tastings. Um, it's 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 incredibly complex. The 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 number of the explosion of fruit on the nose is is extraordinary like you know it's like a the sweetness of it i when i first tasted that sherry i thought it's got to be sweetened with sugar there's got to be like corn syrup or some kind of burnt sugar in there or something mm. and they they don't what they do is they take the grapes <clears throat> that are grown in the chalky soil outside of Jerez. it's on the way if you go from if you know Jerez, it's from Jerez down to cadiz along those chalky hills there right and they grow these grape varieties, the Pedro Jimenez variety of grape, and they raisin it, right? So they allow, they allow it to dry out in the sun, and then they bring that in, and they have their own press there in the, the bodega, and they press it, and they get a ridiculously small amount of must out of those grapes. And then it's fermented with the um, yeast that naturally occurs on the grape skin. There's no added, uh, 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 yeast to it, right? And it takes 18 months for it to ferment. Um, and then they age it in the, the cast. Um, and why, why I mentioned that it's coming from the Solaire is that these are genuine sherry casts, right? So what, what's happened with sherry is that the sherry industry has basically gone to its knees. It's gone to, to nothing, right? It used to be huge. You think of like Bristol cream and all of those sherries that used to be all over the world right and they've gone to, to nobody's drinking sherry these days um <clears throat> i even the last time i was in paris i thought oh i'm in paris I'll, i can find some good sherry here there's got to be somebody i couldn't find any good sherry in paris right um besides going to Perez, i've never really had good sherry apart from in the uh, country bar <laughs> <laughs> And um, the, the reason for that is because most sherry these days are going into making casks. They're going into the whiskey industry is exploding. So the, the sherry makers are making far more money out of making sherry casks than they are making sherry. Uh, and that's a bit of a, a shame. <clears throat> so when you want to go out and try and find quote unquote real sherry casks, right? It's very difficult. And, and the reason why I went down there to Jerez to, to see these casts was because Jose Antonio was selling the 1918 Solaire because he needed the money to buy out his brother from the business. So it's not something that they normally do. And they're not casts that are re, you know, regularly available. We had the same distributor in Spain and uh, he went to the distributor and said, I want to sell it to somebody who's gonna do something special with it. And they said, the Teal and Whiskey Company, and so then he sent me this bottle and I was like, what in the hell is that? Like, that's crazy. Uh, and then we saw the price of the cast and I was like, what in the hell is he thinking? That's crazy. They're like, because they're, they weren't cheap. Uh, so yeah, my job was basically to go down there and to make sure that they were the real deal, which they were. Um, and it's a- uh, And if I'm, if I'm- if I'm not mistaken, Alex, it's quite actually quite rare within Hereth and the, the traditional Marco de Hereth to to get um, PX growers. There's only a handful that are still growing sharing the traditional way. The, a lot of the PX that we consume comes from from outside of what would have been considerably, you know, traditionally considered where sherry comes from. Um, yeah, from Montalado. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's it no, it's 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 a fantastic whiskey. It definitely is, and we have a great grow for 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 all things fortified wine down on the Celtic whiskey bar. And um, our PX, our, our what we claim to be the world's best Irish coffee, is actually um, Emilio Hidalgo uh, PX that we use to sweet. Ah. We use the whiskey, and then about 15 mils of, of a really treacly Pedro Jimenez, and then your coffee, and then topped up with with, with a vanilla sweet, sweetened cream, and it's just amazing. That sherry as your sweetener just gives these complex flavors and and kind of darker sweet notes that you don't get when you just sweeten it with sugar. So that's the little trick we do. <laughs> uh -huh. right. we've got a little trick too we should have an uh, Irish coffee uh, uh, contest there 
the, the, the bang bang bar up in uh, the distillery makes a mean uh, Irish coffee uh, with the stout reduction. So we could, we could have the sherry versus stout, maybe see what people like yeah, best. Yeah, no, I would be interested in that, yeah. Yeah. Because I know, Ali, a few years ago, um, someone from Teeling got in touch and said, would you make Teeling your, your go-to whiskey for Irish coffees? And um, Ali said to me, what do you think? And I said, well, I, I'm not, you know, I think we're really proud of Irish coffee and I'm not going to change the, the whiskey content just for the sake of a commercial deal. So I said, but I said, I'm, I'm open to it. You know, you're the boss. And, uh, and he said to, to whoever he was dealing with the said, look, come down to Clarny and if you can make a, an Irish coffee that's better than ours in a heartbeat, Teeling is our is our go to Irish coffee for the thing, and no one from Teeling ever came down. So the 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 the, the gauntlet is still laid. You can come down and beat our Irish the, coffee, then we'll use Teeling as the Irish coffee. The problem there is obvious, Luke. Like I'm no like um, uh, uh, map expert, right? But I'm pretty sure Killarney's beyond the M50. Right? <laughs> well, there you go. That's it's beyond the pale, yeah. <laughs> so like I don't know how you how do you do that? I'm not sure. Like. <laughs> yeah well there you go there's money to be made beyond the pale if they come down and and, uh, and make an irish coffee in the celtic whiskey bar um <laughs> <laughs> we've a, a couple of questions there um uh sorry uh, they, i've lost lost there for seconds um andrew asks uh, inspired by your, your beautiful story of Hareth, do teelings have a cask buy program or buy a cask program like other distilleries Oh, do we have? No, we don't. We don't have a founding fathers or, or one of those uh, cask buying uh, uh, programs. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, quite uh, clear. We did it in Quebec and back in the day. And um, it just became a bit of a nightmare. It became a, a, a you know, people would come to see their casks and uh, want to take a dip and a strength on it. And uh, oh, it's only supposed to be five percent losses, and it's been three years, and I'm already twenty percent down. And like, it just was like, oh, come on now, this is it. It, it, it was a bit of a, a headache. Um, people wanting to have their cast topped up uh, because they shouldn't be out that. <laughs> like, it doesn't really work that way. I'm sorry. Um, so we haven't, we haven't engaged in any of that. Um, I guess it's also probably uh, against the uh, uh, principles of, uh, of John T. Lean of like uh, the whole uh, limited amount and a known quantity. And so like, why would you want to, to sell it? Um, but to be fair, I leave the financing mostly to Jack and Steven there. I try and focus, I've had a hard enough time focusing on making the whiskey as opposed mm -hmm. to, to looking after the numbers, yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose it's also, uh, you know, brands have gone different ways about, because you need to, to raise revenue at the start of your project. And you had straight away, and that's something that maybe after we, we cracked into the Brabazon 4, I was going to ask you about. Um, but you had whiskey straight from off the bat that were selling and selling, you know, I, I don't know your sales figures, but they seemed from the customer's point of view to be doing well in the market. You know, and you have that history, that family history, so to fall back on. Whereas if you yeah, exactly, we hit the ground running. Now. So we had age stock. We had the my big job in the beginning, the first two years, was how are we going to take the stock that we have in the warehouse and create a line of uh, products that we can um, go to market with, and then how are we going to build the distillery to back that up? And uh, mm -hmm. and so that's the process that we've been in. Is is, is how do we create interest like this in our, our stock? And then how do we try and create a distillery that's going to uh, follow that? Yeah. Um, we have a few other questions there. Um, Ronan says, how many times can you use a cask? Uh, that depends. Uh, these casks, these are um, primarily what you would call finishing casks. So you wouldn't like fully mature, be very rare to fully mature in a, a Pedro Jimenez cast at that age. So as a finishing cast, you probably could use it a bit more, maybe uh, three or four times. But typically we would stop after the third is when we would uh, end. Um, I just find that the cast doesn't really, it's not giving a whole lot after that. Mm. Um, and Martin Purcell um, says, surely that's essential travel. I presume referring to the Irish coffee thing, but Martin, this conversation about the Irish coffees took place around uh, 2018, so it's uh, it's not to do with coronavirus. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a couple of more comments there that I do want to come on to in a moment, but I've, I'm conscious because one of them actually references it. So we'll, we'll maybe get the fourth uh, browse on poured. And while we're pouring that, um, uh, Rich says, when can we expect Brabazon 5? Um, which uh, you think there will not be a Brabazon 5. This is it. This is where, if you've only just met the Brabazon series, you, you're welcome to uh, the birth and the, the death, uh, unfortunately. Um, it's not to say there's not going to be more Teeling Whiskey. There'll be more Teeling Whiskey, of course. There'll be more age expressions, too. Uh, we're just ending the Brabazon series for, yeah, several different reasons. We've got the uh, Renaissance series also that we have uh, going on at the moment. Uh, so there's a bit of uh, wanting to focus more on uh, that. Um, and I think after, well, it's been, but well, Brabazon 1 came out in 2017. So, you know, it's been, it's been a while now. And we thought mm -hmm. that like it was time to just sort of, um, move on to the next thing so so we've done that yeah no fair enough and um the there was a couple of comments uh, including what adrian says there about any brabazon three left and and i know that um there's brabazon two available at celtic whiskey um but we don't have any three left i'm afraid um and i don't believe there's any four left but i'm open to a correction on that um so i think at the moment from us anyway you can only buy number two uh, which also is what makes this tasting so exciting and unique as well um, so t t tell us about this, this Brabazon, uh, four. Brabazon four comes in this lovely dark box again with the Brabazon house there. So what we've got here is a 13 year old single malt that's been matured in. Now we start getting into the semantics of things, right? It's a Carcavelos. When they say white port. Now, the people in Carcavelos think that there's uh, four styles of fortified wine made in Portugal, right? Port, Madeira, Muscat or Muscatel, yeah, and uh, Carcavelos. Now, Carcavelos is a town. Carcavelos is one place. It's it's on the uh, Bay of Lisbon. It's on. If you've ever been to Cascai, uh, you or, or Estoril. Right, you've been by Carcavelos, just didn't know it. Uh, it's a small little area. It's a gorgeous part of the world. I would love to get back there myself. Um, and what they make there is they make essentially what is a white port. They uh, so the story goes back uh, quite a ways. The uh, the first president of Portugal, right? He was the guy that created the AOC for port. Right? He said, you can only make port up in the Duro Valley. It has to be made up in the Duro Valley. It can't be made anywhere else. Oh, except for my back garden also. <laughs> uh, and his back garden was in Carcavelos. So there was a 16 hectare or 16 acres uh, of his back garden in Carcavelos that you can make port also. But the uh, port, well, in that area, the, the grapes that grew were, were white grapes. They weren't red grapes. Right up in the Duro Valley, you get, you get Duro red wine, you get port. You've got your ruby and your tawny ports up there, right? Um, and uh, down in Lisbon with the sea air, uh, what grew there was white uh, grapes. And so what um, they grew in Carc Carcavelos was uh, well, white wine grapes. And so what we have here is a yeah, 13 year old single moth again at 49.5% alcohol that's been aged in Carcavelos casks. Now, the Carcavelos, okay, I we went on holidays, this is a number of years ago, to Kashkai, and I was like, this is great. I can go visit Carcavelos and see the winery. And so I had a whole thing set up to go see the winery, right? And before that, uh, staying in Kashkai, Oh, we'll go out to some bars and I'll get some Carcavelos wine or I'll go to the uh, bottle shops or go to the off licenses and I'll buy some Carcavelos wine, right? Went around town asking people. People are looking at you like you're the crazy tourist. <laughs> no, it doesn't. That never heard of it doesn't exist. No, Carcavelos is a town. I said, I know it's a town. I, they, they make a wine there. Do you have the 
No, we don't. It's very hard to find. It's very hard to find, even if you're three train stops down from Carcavelos itself. Um, and so went to the winery, went to said winery. Now, this is going to look a bit pathetic, I know, especially after the size of the uh, sherry cask. But what I got was it's, that's the place where it comes from. Villa Ortiz, or, or yeah. You can, <laughs> Uh, it is a fortified white wine that's sort of that kind of color. Now you say, like, why do you only have this test tube of it, Alex? Why don't you have a full bottle of it? Because we were on holidays. And in and, 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 and retrospect, I should have walked out of there with a case. But um, they gave me a, a bottle, and they gave me uh, two of these things, and all I have left is two of these things. It's very hard to find. Um, but what it did to this whiskey is nothing short of amazing. I think that that nose has got such a rich mm. fruitiness off of it. An amazing, like there's, a, there's that dried sultana kind of element. I guess it's sort of similar to the Pedro Jimenez, right? Mm. But there's actually, also that. If that I was given a blind, I would have said it was a, a sherry cask. I wouldn't have thought it was it was any way related to to port, just off the nose personally. But it it it's got it's got lovely peachy notes coming through as well. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan. Bourbon cream um, biscuit in a glass says says Oliver, which I think is a is a good shout too. Um, uh, and Ben says best for last. So definitely. Well, cheers. I don't know about definitely. The spice, the spice on this is, is quite amazing on the taste. Oh, wow. It's so creamy and that lovely bit of spice on the finish. It's. Mm. Yeah. And it's it's very dry, but it almost hits afterwards. <laughs> it's dry in the finish. It's lovely. Mm. Yeah. So, Brabazon three and Brabazon four were us taking what we liked the most from Brabazon one and two and highlighting, trying to put it forward in its best light, best way that we could, right, with a, a decent age statement on there. Again, at the 49.5% alcohol and trying to, you know, with Bravo's on four, really go out with a bang with those Carcavelos casts. Mm. Um, the, the, five, the three and four almost seem like more, not that, I mean, I'm a big fan of one and two as well, but three and four almost feel like um, a different level, like, you know, like a more mature, refined mm. um, release, you know, um, and maybe... In some in some respects, that's a, a metaphor for for Irish whiskey and the Teeling brand. Since you said the first one came out in 2017, and tasting this, it's like uh, a real maturity and almost coming of age in 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 the kind of story we've gone through tonight. I'm very very impressed by those last two. The two I hadn't tried were phenomenal. This I'm still tasting this one while I'm talking. It's it's great. Um, no, it's it's very good. And a few people in the the chat. Terry says three is the winner. Um, uh, two is has my vote. All good though. Jared Kelly says, Alex, what is your favorite of the Teeling Small Batch series? Um, oh, I, I guess that's a reference to the different collaborations we've done with the Small Batch. I don't, you know, it's it's difficult. I'd like, even if it just was the Brabazon series, I would say probably two and four would be my favorites of that. But like, I, I do love uh, three also. Um, and it's not that I don't like one. One is lovely too but i'd say if i had to go with the it was like it was 1 a.m and we're saying we're gonna luke we're gonna have one more right <laughs> we're just gonna have one just the one more right i'd probably be reaching for bravos on four like that's mm. no that's interesting that's good no it's um actually along those lines because we were talking earlier you were saying about consistency and and um how you, you know, blending by committee and everything you discussed earlier. Um, maybe as we kind of come towards the end of the tasting, talk to us a bit about the, the I actually, we did a tasting through work with you guys um, about a month ago 
tasting the the core range just as like a staff training thing and then um i was asked to to, to join it and i started kind of thinking well i can't you know i'm fairly familiar with teeling it's like when i first started working with celtic and i used to present some of the the irish whiskey experience classes and um sure teeling whiskeys were always in the lineup so i drank them quite regularly but i hadn't drank the small batch for a long time or or any of the three of them actually for to be honest and so we did this staff training and i can't get over how different they are and, and um very very different whiskeys than when i when i used to drink them regularly which maybe back 2016 2017 um, and they're all obviously all now they're now all your own stock or else great northern grain um maybe tell us about managing that transition and how you found that uh there's been elements of it that were uh, uh good that were were nice i think that the single grain yeah has made that transition quite well i think the small batch has uh two um for me what was intimidating like, like I, I i'd already had the experience of working with the teelings for a number of years right in cooley and uh going into quebec and into the testament arch of the warehouse there along the river and uh you know seeing those casts and those the, the amazing casts right but, like those were laid down before I uh, I got there, those were like the, and there was, you know, a good fifty other Cooley employees, Noel Sweeney, David Hines. There was a lot of the people that were around that like you know knew where the casts are, knew what they were, knew you know the details of them, all of that. Right, I sort of felt like I was the um, you know the new kid on the block that was maybe trying to. Um, not shake things up, but like add my two cents to the conversation, right? Wanted to be at the big table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when teeling happened, it was, uh, okay, here you are in this empty warehouse. And then the lorries start showing up with like the cast coming off and like the empty warehouse gets spilled to the gills with whiskey and it's due, right? <laughs> you're like, uh, <laughs> okay um what are we gonna do now uh and um like at the time i had the the i guess luxury of, of nine months of trying to like become familiar with the the stock and figure out like okay what can we do where are we at how would this be how would you replace stuff in the future if you wanted to do that, right? What, what do you have that's uh, definitely a limited uh, uh, quantity? And so you have to try and do something special with it, like the Brabazons, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what I think we did get right in that core range, Luke, was the small batch. And that this idea of uh, we can take grain whiskey that's been matured in bourbon cast, we can take malt whiskey that's been matured in bourbon cast, we can take a variety of different ages, Right, I mean, like a variety of different uh, percentages and, and, and strengths, right? And we can blend that together, put it back into a rum cask for a year, and it has this magical transformation where it comes out totally different. And that's been very um, powerful for us as we've made that transition from the stock that we had at the beginning to the stock that we've created with the Great Northern Distillery and with the Tealing Distillery. And New Market Square, and so to um, to try and have some consistency, and yeah, thank you very much for for pointing out some, hopefully some some improvements along the way where the quality can can get better um, has been an amazing journey to go on. Because mm. it's 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 the small batch particularly because I was actually presenting a, a private tasting private version of these that we did. And uh, I did it with a range of the, the small batch, the and the Polcastle, the Connemara, and a Redbreast. And um, the the small batch of the range I hadn't tried since the, the change. And and I looked, dusted off some of my old notes, and I was like, okay, this is when I presented this tasting before. This is what I used to kind of say and stuff. And then I tasted it myself while doing the tasting, and I was like, this is a different whiskey altogether. <laughs> you know, it's like it's it's it's. I, I'm I'm a big fan. I think it's it's. I think it's got more. Um, I think the port, the, the rum cast comes through more. Do you know? I think the the malt is a bit fresher. It's got a, it's got that kind of green appleiness. There's a there's a kind of real crispiness to it that you don't necessarily you can get with the old one, or at least 
you know, I haven't tried the old one in a long time, but from my notes, you didn't get, you know, and, um, or my memory as well. Um, but I think I'm impressed. No, I think it's, it's very good. And it's, it's, it must've been a nerve wracking step because it's, it's a, it's a huge moment for the brand. Cause as much as we're enjoying these, these four, and, and that's another question that's in the chat that I'm going to come on to in a second about, you know, these are unique one-off releases and, and different things. Whereas that's your bread and butter, I suppose, you know, that, that range. So yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. That is the bread and butter. That's the, the day in day out. Like, what are we, what are we doing today? We're making a small batch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, the, what was I going to say about the small batch? Oh, you know, the breakthrough for me was embracing the chaos. I, I thought that it was like my job to go into the warehouse and try and make sense out of it all. And to be like, we're definitely taking uh, row 14 and then row 12 next and then row 10 and then row 11. And like we're gonna, we have a plan for the next year and this is how it's going to work out, right? And, um, what I actually learned was that uh, it's much better to look at it like a, a palette, right? Like, like, like a painter, right? Mm -hmm. And to realize like, I've got a bit of red, I've got a bit of orange, I've got a bit of green here and some blues. And these are the different things that I can do to, to paint a painting. Uh, each time I'm trying to paint the same painting or maybe a bit better or a little bit different than it was the, the last time, right? And so that like, we can, they're, they're at least 12 months in the rum cask but we've got august filling we've got june's filling we've got may's we've got september we've got a, a variety of different both first fill rum cask and second fill rum cask and then we can adjust those blends as to which rum cask we're going into mm -hmm. and leave them in there for different times and, and so you can start to create a blend that's going to be your rum raisin nose. You can start to create a blend that's going to be your sweet toffee finish. You can create a blend that's going to have your, yeah, your apple fruitiness in there, right? And then you can start to pick from those different parts and mix it all together. And, and that's uh, a technique called progressive blending. Mm. Uh, and it's been very, very powerful for us in trying to make that trans transformation from one source to another. So what you're saying, uh, sorry, but you're so which which is my understanding from the what tasting we did as well is that you're that these blends you're obviously blending it before the rum cask. So it's 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 ex bourbon single malt, ex bourbon grain. It's married and then it's finished in the rum cask together, as opposed to taking finishes and marrying them, blending them after the fact. Is, is... we're blending it twice. Mm -hmm. We blend uh, it so once you're, you're then put it into the rum cask, and then I take a blend of rum casks. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's that's, that's uh, progressive blending. It sounds about the right term for it. It's 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 fascinating stuff. Um, and I'm sure all the whiskey nerds uh, listening will, will appreciate um, appreciate that. No, it's it's very interesting. Um, and yeah, I'm best to look with it going forward as well. Um, there's a few questions that have come in while we're chatting, and and they all are phrased differently, but all basically mean the same thing. That with with the the revival series coming to an end and this series coming to an end, what's what's next in the pipeline? Is there any sneak previews we can get? What's next is pretty amazing. What's next, I, I'm really uh, excited about. Uh, what's next is uh, our single malt, the first single malt made solely from Newmarket Square, right? So, so, so having that line in the sand, if you will, and uh, trying to match what we've had in sourced single malt with our, our, our own. And, and taking, see now, we've got the, the phrase that the number that I always throw out there is over a hundred different cast types in the warehouse. I actually went and re-looked at it there over Christmas. There's over 200 different cast types that we have in the <laughs> wow. warehouse. And uh, we did that not just because we wanted to come out with a Carcavelos 13 year old single malt, right? We did that because we could put some of the 13 year old single malt and Carcavelos casts, right? And we could learn from that, right? And have a, a limited release, right? But then there's the 75 other Carcavelos casts that we could fill with pot still and single malt and other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we've got 200 different cast types, right? But like with a variety of different things that they're filled with, sec, you know, double distilled, triple distilled, peated, different grain types, 
all of there's a candy store back there in the warehouse. And um, and so what I'm really excited about coming out next is uh, our single malt. And then we've also got um, the progression, I guess is the word I would use, of our pot still. And I think that the pot still is really coming along nicely. I think that people, we, we I don't wanna say we made a mistake, but we, with the different batches in the beginning of the pot still, people, I don't think quite understood what we were trying to do. We were trying to have limited one-off. This is as uh, young as it's ever going to be, uh, mm -hmm. single pot still, right? And what's coming out now is uh, the, the, the more mature and the different cast types and, the, and, and different. And, and, I, and I think that if people were to go back and revisit the single pot still, um, that's, that's making an amazing transformation in the, the warehouse. Similar to what you're talking about there, Luke, with going back to the single grain and the small batch and the single malt there. And then, you know, years later coming back to it, like it, it, it's progressing and it's changing. So there's single pot still, there's a single malt. We've got, uh, the plantation pineapple casts, uh, coming out, uh, again, we've got, uh, the going back to the ginger beer, uh, again, we've got, um, we've got a variety of different stuff. There's, there's one that we just filled uh, this other day that I'm, um, um, just this week, just two days ago, that I'm really looking forward to is, um, the, um, Oh, I'm gonna get that. I, I, <laughs> um, orange liqueur from the Caribbean, uh, starts with a C. Um, is it cachaca or yeah, cacha no, no, not not, not, not cachaca, no. Um, Curacao. I want to say, say cassis, but cassis, no, cassis, yeah, Curacao says Jeff in the or Curacao. Yeah. Yes. That's the uh, that's the triple sec, like yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have some uh, uh, French curacao um, uh, from uh, our, our lovely friends over there uh, in Cognac, and um, it's I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm looking forward to other little things. There's one we've got a 1991 uh, purple muscat cask that is out of this world. Uh, I don't know when the hell that's ever gonna get released, but like really looking forward to that. Um, yeah. There's, no, there's no, a wide it sounds opportunity. really exciting, yeah. Jesus. yeah. I need to get myself a job at Teeling. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, so I get I know, a joke, so I could try all the samples, but um, the, the, yeah, no, it sounds, it sounds, it sounds very exciting, Alex. Uh, and uh, people in the chat seems to agree. Um, a few people have mentioned while we were chatting there as well that the, the Black Pit series and, and what's to come yeah. in, that, in that range or in that, you know, in the peated mold coming to going down the line. So the yeah, Black Pits has been really great. I think what Black Pits has done that has been smart, I think what we did right with Black Pits was the triple distilling of the peated single malt. And that straight away, people can be um, fans or not fans of isla right and you can say yes this is like isla but different this mm -hmm. is this is a triple distilled peated single malt so it's lighter and people oh, all right i haven't tried a triple distilled peated single malt before and then we went in with the salt turn cast which we knew was going to be a success from the 24 year old and the 28 year old and the 21 year old and um that has been really interesting as to people who don't like don't like peated single malts right who who like a lighter style of the the, the peatedness in there and the uh the pineapple and the uh fruitiness of it coming through has really been um been, been, been fun uh, it's been amazing to see people respond well to the idea of the yeah the black pits so there's gonna be more black pits uh i am Still debate. Which, well, there's a debate that's ongoing as like, uh, would we do a double black pits or do we do a like what? There's 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 a, there's a whole range of other peated single malts that we have put into other cast types, and we just need to figure out what the hell are we going to call it. 
and this is obviously all Keith's thing about that you've distilled in, 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 in Newmarket. Um, but it must be a similar age to the stuff that's coming out of Great Northern now. Do you find any kind of a friendly competition in, in that regard? Yeah. Yeah, I think there is a bit of friendly competition there, right? Like they, what they're doing is double distilled, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and um, they distilled it in a very different way to us, just besides it being double distilled. Uh, so um, I, I think what they're making is, is lovely single malt, but it's more in the Isla sort of tradition. It's got more of that iodine, band-aids, TCP sort of... Uh, single maltiness there uh what's the, what's the ppm on. for year one is it because i know that the, the the great northern one is, is about 55 ppm it's quite smoky well what's your one coming out yeah ours is 55 too but with the triple mm. distilling it goes down to 15. oh wow so we've got uh it's peat but it's peat as the background flake mm-hmm. um <laughs> i did a tasting with the guys at um benny's in chicago and the way that they described it is it's like a dude's rug, right? Like it really ties the room together. And, um, and I, I kind of like that, right? Like it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's what if Pete isn't like just like smacking in the face, right? What if it's, it's there, it's a flavor profile, but it's sort of one of several different flavor profiles that's going on, right? And we, because of the triple distilling, the peatedness has come down, but the fruit has gone up and it's um, it's a very interesting uh, product. Yeah, the dude abides, man. The dude um, abides. The, exactly. <laughs> no, that's no, that's that's fantastic. Listen, there's a few great questions that have popped up there, but I'm conscious of the fact that we've we've had John for an hour and forty minutes now, and and uh, but we we really appreciate uh, your time, Alex. It's it's been a really um, informative tasting. I know I definitely have enjoyed it, so I hope uh, everyone listening still has as well. Um, really, really impressed. Before we leave you, we might um, run down. There was a few further back in the chat. I might try and find if I can see if I can see it again. There was a few people who did lineups quickly. So um, uh, Mike Michael Senex says uh, three, four, and two and one were his prefer- order of preference. Rob says two was top, three followed by four. Um, then Alan Matthews says four, three, one, two. Um, Martin says uh, I should have bought more bottles of four. Um, four, four feels like the best, says Neil. Um, and Adrian says four grows with me with each si- sip. Noreen Casey says four, one, three, then two. Um, interesting. I, 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 yeah, the four, four, one, three. So four seems to be going down very well. I'm going to stick with my original. I, I, I four, I'm a massive fan, but I think three was my favorite of the, of the lineup. Um, so there you go. That's some feedback for your, um, your, your database. <laughs> exactly. Well, that, that, uh, that's great. That's great to have. Um, I like that they're all different. Mm. I like that we've got four single malts that are, you know, vastly different. No one would be like, oh, two is the exact same as three. If you, somebody said you two is three, you'd be like, are you crazy? Like, that's, that's completely nuts. Like, yeah. So, you know, the, the, that there's variety. That there's a different spice of life out there, I think is the important thing. No, definitely, definitely. Look, it's it's been fantastic, and and please keep it up, Alex. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's always a pleasure when we get to chat. Um, so thank you so much, and hopefully we'll we'll see see both you and everyone else in the chat. We might get to see each other soon enough in person uh, when everything uh, lifts, whether that's in a pub or at some whiskey festival or something. Down oh, the line please, oh, sh- <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, well, look. Thank, thanks very much, Alex, and thank you everyone for listening. If there's any more questions or anything I didn't get to, um, hit me up an email, guys. You would all, I'm CC'd into the Zoom link you would have got. So if there's any questions, don't be afraid to, to drop me a line by email. So thanks very much, Alex, and thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.